Well, the good news is nothing blew up. Uh, everything's been shoehorned in and the front panel bolted on. It was a bit like shutting a suitcase, but amazingly it works. The side panels will be added later and the system printer and MIDI sockets will be mounted on those. I'll just switch it on. So go into engineer's mode and press the on switch. Now I missed out one of the printed circuit boards from the last video. It's this uh, timer board up here. It sits on top of the power board and I just removed it for access. So all you can see now are the six display digits. And the timer shows hours, minutes and seconds and is designed specifically for easy performance measurements as opposed to a more traditional clock or uptime counter. I've always found it tricky timing sections of code on different computers. You need access to a system clock to get the start and end times. Then you need some fiddly maths or a handy support routine to subtract the two time values. The Plasma's timer is linked to the run switch, so it starts when your program starts running and stops when it halts. Now the Toy A emulation has no further control over this, but that's fine for overall elapsed time measurements. The other emulations have input and output, or I.O. instructions, which allow you to reset and read the timer at any time, with a resolution of 10 milliseconds. Now this makes it easy to time specific sections within your program with just a couple of instructions. And if you really wanted a time of day clock function, you can poll the timer and maintain a counter on the upper screen over here. Now this video is more to celebrate that the Plasma is finally up and running after all this time, but I did promise to look at jump instructions in a previous video. So I'll use one of those as a means of testing some of the switches and the new speaker clip feature, as well as the teletype output device. Now the speaker makes a click whenever a jump instruction is obeyed. So let's write the simplest possible program which does just that. Now I'll use the basic Toy A emulation for this, so we need to load microcode 1. So set number 1 on the load switches most significant end. We set FMP, which says force microprogram load. We reset all registers and press run. And the microcode loads and halts with the microcode number set on these lights here. We want to reset FMP, light goes off. And we're now ready to obey Toy A instructions. Now here's the instruction set. Now there's no simple unconditional jump, but there is a conditional one, the C opcode, which jumps if the specified register is zero. Now I could use any register, as they are all zeroed when I press reset. These are the registers, reset, but this may not always be the case. So we should really either explicitly load a zero into a register and use that, or we can exploit the fact that in the Toy A emulation, register zero, this one here, is defined to always be zero. It's not like the other 15. This one is fixed at zero and is read only. So writing to it has no effect. So if we use a conditional jump instruction, which says jump if register zero is zero, the program will always jump. It becomes unconditional. And if we jump to the address where the instruction itself is stored, in our case we'll use address zero, it will loop forever, continually obeying the same jump instruction. So let's put the four hex nibbles of the jump instruction onto the load switches. We want C for the opcode, 0 for the condition register, 0, 0 for the destination address. We confirm PC is 0, and the target load register, this red light here, is set to IR, the instruction register. 
and we can press load and the instruction C000 is loaded into address zero. I'll test the program one instruction at a time by pressing the step switch. This will obey the instruction shown in IR and then stop. Now as it's a jump, you should hear a click. I'll just turn that up a bit. PC is still zero because the instruction said to jump to that address. So each time I press step, we get another click. So what happens if I press run? That's right, you get a series of clicks which sound like a tone. Now if I run it at slow speed, you can hear the individual clicks. The speed's here. At medium speed, you can hear the clicks more frequently. And at full speed, Now you may notice the frequency seems quite low for such a short loop. Now I need to confirm this, but I think it's due to the clicks being made from a one millisecond pulse. And if a jump occurs before the previous click has finished, you don't get another click. So I think the upper frequency is limited to about one kilohertz, if I've done my sums right. Now the clicks have no impact on the actual program speed, but I may change this strategy later if it becomes an issue. OK, let's make the loop do something and then use it to test the teletype. How about a simple addition? We'll add the contents of register 3 to itself. And the content should double each time around the loop. So we need a non-zero start value in register 3, otherwise adding 0 to 0 won't be very exciting. I'm not sure adding 1 to 1 will be, but I'm going to do it anyway. Now one way is to load the register manually using the load switch. Now as mentioned, the target load register is shown by this red light and it's currently set to IR. And that's the normal way of entering programs into memory. And we can change the target with the load select switch. We can go up or down. And we'll set it to register 3. Now we enter the value we want, which is 1, on the load switches. And press load. There's the 1. Now this technique is very useful for tweaking programs when they've already started. But when you're setting up a program, as we are here, it's all too easy to press reset to set the PC to 0. And this clears out all other registers as well, like this. It's gone again. So in this case, I'll use the other method and write an initialization instruction into the program, which writes the start value to register 3. Now this means it doesn't matter what register 3 contains when the program starts. And a lot of program bugs are caused by forgetting to initialize things. Right, the four nibbles for the load instruction are 7 for the opcode, 3 for the destination register, and 0-1 for the value. We'll confirm PC is 0, because that's where the instruction is going to go. The target load register needs to be IR, so we need to bring this red light back up to here. Now we can press load and ink. And as we saw in a previous video, that loads the value from the switches into the instruction register and automatically increments PC. So it's now on address one, ready for the next instruction. So now we want an add instruction. And if we look at the table, we need a one for the opcode, three for the destination register, and three and three for the two source registers to be added together. So this will add the contents of register three to itself and store the result back into register three. Now we need to put this instruction into memory. We press load and ink. Okay, now we need an instruction to 
output the contents of register 3 to the teletype device. Now on toy A, the teletype device is this display screen and it acts as a simple scrollable device. It displays numbers in hex and decimal, both unsigned and signed, so you don't have to add extra code to convert from binary. So how do we get our program to output data? Well, if you check the instruction set for toy A, you'll see there's no instruction for I.O. The other emulations, toy B and Plex, both have one, but not toy A. So the way it's done is to treat the very last word in memory as a special case. And the rule is, if a program tries to store a value to that location, the value is displayed on the teletype instead. And conversely, if a program tries to read from that location, the program waits for you to enter numbers on this keypad. And we'll try that later. So this special address allows us to have two I.O. functions, a read and a write, without sacrificing any of the 16 opcodes. And we'll see later how the other emulations do it. A toy A has a memory size of 256 words, so addresses range from 0 to 255. The special address is the last one, 255, which is hex FF. So we want an instruction for storing the contents of register 3 to location FF. And the 9 instruction looks just the job, so we'll set it up on the load switches. We want 9 for the opcode, 3 for the register, and F, F for the destination address. Press load and ink to store the instruction. And now we can add the final jump instruction. And this time we want to jump back to the add instruction, which is at address one. If we jump back to address zero, like we did before, the program will reload register three with one each time. So we won't see much happening. Right, the nibbles are C for the opcode, 0 for the condition register, and 0, 1 for the address. Press load. And that's it. I'll reset everything. And I'll just run it at slow speed so you can see what happens. You can hear the clicks from the jump and the display here. OK, I'll stop it now. And you can see the value is doubling each time as intended. But the addition has overflowed at this point. The register only contains 16 bits. So we've got to the maximum it can store and it's gone back to zero and it will stay at zero from now on. OK, that's it for now. See you next time.